Hi, I'm Jennifer Bangs, the host of She Bangs, She Bangs, Marriage, Adultery, Texas, and Jesus. You can find this podcast on all the podcast places or on my website, shebangshebangs.com forward slash podcast, or you can find it obviously right here. This is episode four, plan B. So grab a glass of anything, it doesn't matter, and welcome. Cheers. Welcome back to She Bangs, She Bangs, Marriage, Adultery, Texas, and Jesus, a totally spiritual and equally foul-mouthed podcast about marriage, mistresses, and possibilities. I'm your host, Jennifer Bangs. Plan B. It's quite different than Plan A. When I learned the Canadian my husband had been having an affair with for the last six months was not the last woman he'd been with, that there had been four more... My previous plan of love and grace was immediately aborted. This definitely fell into the category of, I'm going through shit, the Igots Club I'd started to get together, pour wine, and share stories. So, grab a glass of anything, doesn't matter, and welcome to IGTS, episode four, plan B. Cause the joke that you made in the bed that was me, and I'm not gonna fade as soon as you close your eyes. If James wanted to divorce me, fine. But while I was still legally his wife, some things would need to change. I told James we needed to go back to bullshit advice lady counselor, and it was there in her office I'd stormed out of the week before that I laid out a new plan. James was not allowed to come over to the house anymore. We would split custody 50-50, and he would take Andrew three or four days a week and I the other half. We would drop him off and pick him up at the babysitter's house so we wouldn't even have to see each other. Because James worked, he would need to take Andrew to the sitters on his allotted days as I wouldn't be watching him then. Andrew would start staying overnight with James, so he would need to get his own place and move out of his Bill and Ted, Beavis and Butthead, Venice Beach apartment he shared with random people he'd found on Craigslist. If there was anything James needed to translate to me about Andrew, he could do it through the nanny. The counselor nor James said much during the session. They both just stared and nodded, and then time was up. James and I walked out of the office, and standing on the sidewalk in the sunny spring of L.A., he told me he thought that this was a good idea, that he needed this swift kick in the pants. Whatever. I was done coddling him or his needs. I've started to get some feedback from listeners over the last several weeks, and one question seems to keep popping up. Why the H-E double hockey sticks was I sticking around for this guy? It's important to reiterate that when James first left, he didn't leave me in the middle of a terrible marriage. I can't emphasize enough that I had been happy. James had masked any and all displeasure so well that I had no clue he even had a negative thought toward me. So when he revealed that he had cheated on me and was divorcing me, The man telling me this was a man I utterly loved and thought adored me up until that very moment. So it wasn't like his affair was the cherry on top of a shitty marriage. It was a complete about face to what I deemed a really great life. Then as our separation dragged on and I was forced to consider what life would be like divorced, I thought a lot about our son, Andrew, and how unfair it was that both James and I got to grow up in intact homes and we weren't going to give our son the same. I knew how divorce could wreck a kid from the number of my friends who said as much over the years. I had had the fairy tale and wanted it back. I saw this affair as the thing to overcome, to get back to what we had, not the thing that would destroy it all. 
Besides, I knew God was on my side of saving this thing. I knew God hated divorce. I had no idea where it said that in the Bible, but everyone in church knows God hates it. We know he made rainbows, loves children, and hates divorce. That's like the part of God no one disagrees on. But one morning, right before my husband's big fun reveal and counseling of his multiple makeout partners, I came upon a section in the Bible where God files for divorce from his people. He gives them a writ of divorce. When I read that, I was like, wait, what? Now, I'm going to say straight up, I have not studied these verses or excavated all the Hebrew from them or even heard a sermon on it. So if you're a theologian or scholar listening and your mind is exploding because I'm reading it wrong, I don't care. What these verses seem to be saying to me was, consider all the tactics of God, Jen. In ancient Israel, during the time of the prophet Jeremiah, God had a little disobedience problem on his hands. He'd given his people rain and manna and paths through the wilderness, but his people were still rebellious. So one day, the God who we say hates divorce and will never leave you is like, fine, peace out, I'm divorcing you. God had tried a number of tactics with his children to bring them back into relationship with him. Sometimes he brought war or famine. Sometimes he stopped listening to them. Sometimes he coaxed them back into his graces. Sometimes he cried over them and forgave them. But never did God continue to bless them with the benefits of a relationship with him while they turned away. And this is what I felt God showing me. If he doesn't even give that kind of blessing, the benefits of a relationship to the wayward, why was I? I was still continuing to show James love and affection and grace and company and sexual gratification and dinner and anything and everything he wanted or needed, all the while he was having an affair with someone. The whole time during our separation, I would cry out to God for him to show James some consequences to his choices, and now I was realizing I had been withholding the biggest consequence of them all. Me! God is a crafty motherfucker. That's a quote from a good friend. And before you are horrified, I'd put those words together in a sentence. Consider that the true blue Rick Astley never going to give you up God used the threat of a divorce writ to get through to his children. So when I learned that there had been other affairs, it was like the dam broke and I was like, writ out. James immediately got an apartment across the street from Whole Foods in Sherman Oaks, five miles south of where we lived. He signed a one-year lease. This gutted me. It seemed one step closer to divorce. The first four days Andrew was with me wasn't any different than the many days I'd spent alone with him. What was different was knowing James wouldn't be coming over. And you know what? I actually didn't mind. I actually enjoyed the peace and quiet, my head and heart not twisting in knots wondering what James was up to. I knew what he was up to and it wouldn't be with me. I decided during this time when James wasn't around, I'd keep a journal for him. And one day, if he ever came back, he could read about what Andrew and I did on those days. So I kept a journal and things seemed okay. Then it came time to drop Andrew off with the nanny and things were not okay. I had never spent more than a few hours away from my son. Not that I'm some mom who can't bear to be away from her child. There just wasn't a very long leash between the two of us since James had left and I was breastfeeding. And knowing under what circumstances I was being separated from my son, it sucked. But I dropped Andrew off with Nicole and drove back home. I woke up the next morning and it was weird. The house was totally, completely silent. No baby cooing or crying for me to get up. Just silence. I didn't like it. The phone rang. It was the nanny Nicole. Girl, come on over. James just dropped Andrew off for the day, and I know you want to see him. <laughs> I'd met Nicole a couple years prior at church. When James first left me that previous autumn, I'd gone to church the Sunday after and saw Nicole from across the room. We didn't know each other that well then, but she came up, threw her arms around me, and said, Oh, child, say nothing. I know exactly what you're going through. I told her I didn't know how to function, and I needed a nanny to help me with Andrew, but didn't know any. She laughed and said, don't you know that's what I do? So Nicole started coming over a couple times a week to watch Andrew. And now, several months later, I was heading over to her house to see my son while my husband paid her to watch him. Nicole was very compassionate to our family situation. In her family situation, Nicole had almost lost her marriage. Years before, at the time, she had just given birth and had some serious postpartum medical issues. They gave her a bunch of Oxycontin. 
She got hooked on the stuff, and one day, in a drugged-out stupor, she slept with someone else and never told her husband. Months passed, and one night her husband had a dream Nicole cheated on him. It was a very vivid dream. So vivid, he confronted her about it, and when he did, she broke down in tears and confessed. Her husband stormed toward the front door, and before he could reach the threshold, Nicole, crawling on the ground, lurched toward him, grabbing his ankles and sobbing, Please don't leave me. Her husband acquiesced and never left, but his heart did that day. Nicole sobered up and became an even lovelier woman than she was before, but her husband never forgave her. And so, though she had done the cheating, like me, she was trying her best to be loving and patient with the man she was raising her family with. Their home became a respite for me. I loved hearing her thoughts from the perspective of the adulterer, though hers was only once, and I enjoyed hearing her husband's perspective as a man. Though there was still tension in the air of the home, I think having Andrew and me there gave them another family to think about besides their own, and I absolutely loved them for it. Nicole was also a great cook, and because she had two kids and a third on the way, there was never a shortage of food. It was during this time that my appetite came back. She and her husband would laugh about how much I would eat. I guess I was making up for seven months' worth. That first week of James and my stark separation, I came upon a website for couples who are divorcing. It's a website focused solely on how parents should interact around the children. I texted James the website link since I felt it was important for Andrew. James texted back and said he thought it was a great site. I don't remember at what point or why I talked to James on the phone that first week, but I did. I explained to him in a little fuller detail my stipulations for our separation. I told him I didn't expect him not to have any feelings for this woman anymore. I told him, though it hurt, his feelings for her were completely real and I couldn't deny them or pretend they weren't there. I told him I knew it would take time to get over her. I told him I didn't expect things to be all swell if he decided to come back and that I wasn't expecting any declarations of his love for me or for our marriage. All he had to do was cut all communication off with her. And if he did that, he would have access to me. He could talk to me, he could date me, he could have sex with me, he could move back in, he could not. Whatever he wanted. But only if there was a definite end to everything. Everything between him and any other woman. I mentioned this conversation with James because it's one of the pivotal ones during our separation. He's told me long after the conversation ever took place how helpful it was. How part of the reason he was wrestling with coming back was that he couldn't get over his feelings for her. Once he heard that I understood, it freed him. I was really just quoting all the books I'd been reading, but he didn't know that. I meant everything I said. I learned a lot about feelings and affairs more than I ever wanted to, but me sharing this information with him was crucial. And as hard as it was to hear him talk about her, I listened. There is a whole psychology behind fighting for your marriage alone, and this is one of the caveats. As counterintuitive as it feels, when your spouse is opening up to you about the other person, on a base level, they are opening up to you. Trust is being formed, and yeah, it's appalling, but if I could listen as non-judgmentally as possible, then this would open up my husband even more. And what I got was a softer husband who started to see that the woman I'd been showing him the last seven months wasn't reverting back to the woman he left. And what I also got was a husband who was starting to be honest with me. Another week passed. I got a phone call from James about work. James currently was running his own company and had been for a few years. Remember, he originally had wanted to make movies for Jesus, but after some shitty internships in Hollywood, he figured it'd make more sense to make a lot of money doing something he was good at, entrepreneurship and computer programming, and then re-enter the entertainment arena when he had some financial weight behind him. He was calling to tell me he'd sold his latest company and walked away with $800,000 from the sale. Considering he made well over $200,000 a year, this made us millionaires overnight. Well, it made him a millionaire overnight. James hadn't cut off any finances at this point, but with this new situation going on between us, I wasn't sure what would happen. I was glad he told me. I mean, that seemed to be something, right? But I didn't feel like celebrating. I didn't know if I'd ever see that money. And mostly, my heart was still broken. I didn't care about the money. I really didn't. I wanted my husband home. I wanted my family in one piece. 
All a million dollars would do would give him more reasons not to come back to me for now he could hire an au pair and pay to fly the Canadian here every weekend while riding off into a sunset paved with cash. I was also pissed because I was like, really, God? My husband gets rewarded in the middle of an affair? I need you to make his life harder, not easier. Where are the consequences to sin? Where's the karma? And as I was praying, the song Brand New Day popped into my head. I didn't know all the lyrics, but the notes reverberated through my brain. This is sometimes how God speaks to me. I'll often wake up with a song lyric in my head, and most of the time it's a song I heard the night before or a piece I'd been working on. But sometimes it's really, really random and specific. And those times I pay special attention. And if I get a sixth sense that God is trying to tell me something, I'll look up the words to the song. But this was the first time I'd ever heard music while I was praying. My stomach clenched. I knew God was trying to talk to me, but I did not want to look up the words. I didn't know the song that well, but the words brand new day sounded like it was going to be about a new day with a new love and God was preparing me that James was going to move on. Or maybe it was meant for me that things wouldn't work out like I hoped, but one day things would be sunnier and I'd be okay in a brand new day. Either way, I didn't like the sound of it and I didn't want to, sorry for the pun, face the music. But I knew I had to accept whatever it was God was trying to tell me. So I pulled up the song online and as Gordon's raspy, mellifluous voice rang out and I started piecing together what the lyrics were actually saying, I was like, wait a minute, 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 minute. turn the clock to zero, honey, I'll sell the stock, we'll spend all the money, we're starting up a brand new day, turn the clock to zero. And one week later, James called and said he'd cut everything off with the Canadian. Eight months after it started, it was now over. James asked me to come over and see his new place. I thought it'd be weird. It wasn't. I thought I'd hate it. I didn't. It was a little sad to be sure, very bachelor-like in its sparse decor. But there was something sweet about seeing his own place again, like I had years before. It felt like we were dating again. I guess we were. James told me he didn't end things because he wanted to move back in, but that he wanted to have a real separation. What have the last eight months been, I wanted to scream, but I zipped my lips and just listened. (laughs) So much of what fell out of his mouth was donkey dung, but I'd been learning that this was a process and there were good days, like when we went to the park and I'd catch him staring at me with a little smile on his face. And bad days, like when he'd rush out the door after putting Andrew to bed, citing he just needed space. There were times his insensitivity made me want to bash his head in, and other times I'd grab glimpses of a little boy who was so disappointed in the man he was now. Psychologically, James was all over the place. If someone were to read my diary during this time, they'd think I was a loon for every other entry was me taking turns cursing the man to his grave or telling God how hopeful I was. I had to be really patient. I had to constantly remind myself how far we'd come and to give it more time. Because Plan B had only lasted a couple of weeks, there wasn't much disruption to our new normal. The only difference was that James had an apartment closer to where we lived, so we started spending more time together. Not a crazy amount more, we were still very much separated, but there was a definitive move towards us behaving more like a family unit. Andrew never slept over at James's again, and I was back to having Andrew home with me all day. Though there wasn't any need to take him to Nicole's anymore, I still did. 
I had grown to adore our time together and liked that Andrew and Nicole's kids could play together. James started coming back to the house every night, and sometimes he'd sleep over on the couch. At the time, he had a Blackberry, and it would tumble onto that eggplant-colored carpet whenever he fell asleep. His phone beckoned me, like a freaking Greek siren. I heeded the call, and any time he fell asleep, I would dig through his phone. He wasn't talking to her anymore, nor flirting with anyone, but I saw old texts and photos of the two of them. I learned she was a volleyball player, and I learned his pet name for her. I felt ill. In my head, I knew I was only doing what anyone in my position would do, glean information surrounding my husband's lies, but in my gut, I never felt better after I went through his phone. I always felt worse. After a few times, I finally stopped and never picked up his phone again. I felt good. Victorious. This was a big point of contention in my Igots group. When and if to spy, how to spy. Beth, the one with the financially MIA husband and a newly adopted baby, set up a fake account and friended her husband's mistress, and the dummy accepted it. So Beth would sit there trolling through her husband's girlfriend's account every day. Lee, the one battling the Swede, had all the passwords to her husband's stuff, and because he wasn't very tech-savvy, or maybe he didn't think his wife was, she'd spy on him through all his accounts. Social media, phone, credit card, you name it. My friends were obsessed, but they always felt sick about it. I asked them why they wouldn't stop if it never made them feel better. One of them said she wanted to know what was coming her way so she could be a step ahead of it all. I challenged her that maybe God would let her know. She didn't like that idea. James gradually started opening up to me. It was here I'd catch glimpses of his world during the past several months, filling in the gaps I'd been so curious about or so fearful over. I knew one of his roommates in Venice Beach was a girl, a beautiful one. I often wondered what their relationship was and what he told her about me. One weekend afternoon, he revealed that she was one of the biggest advocates for us getting back together. <laughs> really? Oh yeah, he said. I talked to her more than anyone about you. She was really excited to hear that I was moving out. In fact, she wants us to come to a house party she's throwing next week. And so we went. It was surreal. James told me one of the biggest wake-up calls was at that Venice Beach apartment. He'd have to park the green Volkswagen on the street, and every morning he had to wake up at 6.45 a.m. to move it. Considering James never went into the office before 10 a.m., it was not a welcomed protocol. One morning, his alarm clock blared to get up and go move his car, and James thought, I have a driveway. I have a driveway attached to a house. I have a driveway and a house. What am I doing in this shitty apartment moving my car at the crack of dawn every day? One of the most extraordinary things I learned was that James had not had any sexual contact with a Canadian or any other woman for the two months leading up to him ending everything with her. This meant that when I had felt God say to go seduce my husband, he never went back to her after that. And this was such a startling and incredible discovery because my ear had been so close to the ground that whole time and I realized it had paid off. It was deeply deeply encouraging that I could trust God and my ability to hear from him. I was pretty sure they weren't seeing each other during that time, but I couldn't know for sure. Only in retrospect could I ascertain that God never intended for me to be going to bed with my husband while he was also sleeping with someone else. God waited until he knew that that had ended before he encouraged me to be sexual with James again. I was encouraged by these retrospective victories Knowing that God was strategizing with me helped ease the pain and strengthened my resolve to keep fighting for our marriage. But my heart was certainly fatigued and I was growing impatient for a little reprieve from the constant drama. I guess I'm learning. I must be warmer now. I'll soon be turning around the corner.
In June, I got a call from a director who needed to replace his Eliza in My Fair Lady. I'd done the role a couple years prior, and so, without an audition, was offered the part. Normally, any actress would jump at the chance to play one of the best roles in musical theater, but the show was three hours away in San Diego for three months. I wasn't sure how that would work. But I figured mommy getting to have a little playtime of her own and getting to be something but jilted wife in the nursing gravy train was a smart move. I didn't even ask James and accepted the role. Rehearsals were to start in two weeks. This was perfect timing because just two days before rehearsal, James, Andrew, and I were flying to Florida for a very big event. We had two very big events in Florida on the calendar that weekend, but we still weren't sure which event we were going to. Either James's 10-year high school reunion or his kid sister's wedding. A little backstory. James's family, as I've said, were really awesome during our separation. They'd welcomed me into all their homes over Christmas when James went to Canada, and I'd also flown to Aspen to spend a week with James's one sibling who didn't live in Florida. I spoke to James's dad almost every day on the phone, and when things got too emotional for his dad to handle, James's mom took over, and I spoke to her almost every day. I would alternate between talking to James's five sisters, and because I'd grown up with two brothers, having all these sisters was awesome. It was all so overwhelmingly supportive. In fact, I didn't mention in the previous episode because there was just too much information to cover, but James's entire family had orchestrated an intervention just a few months before. All six siblings and all their spouses and both James's parents descended onto our little house in Van Nuys in the spring. Getting 13 adults with kids and jobs to stop everything and pay for flights and hotels to come talk to their son or brother about his dumb behavior is impressive. I couldn't believe a family was willing to put that much money where their mouths were. They were all extremely disappointed in James and the actions he was taking, and they knew the power of their clan. There were a lot of them, and the message was clear. This is not how this family behaves. You were raised better than that. You have a pastor slash marriage counselor for a father, for God's sake, and we are all married to our first spouse and we all have kids and we're all making it work. You have a beautiful wife who loves you and a beautiful son who needs you and as nicely and kindly as can be said, what the hell are you doing? It was astonishing. I felt so loved, so ratified. One of the caveats of the intervention was that James's kid sister, the sister he was closest to, the sister his parents had so James could have a friend, the sister that told James she wanted him to walk her down the aisle if their father ever died, that sister told him that if he was still involved with the Canadian or anyone for that matter, James was not invited to the wedding. I was, but he was not. So when James cut things off with the Canadian and we were dating again, I was so excited to fill the family in. They could not have cared less. My words went into a vacuum. I was expecting a celebration, not this, this nothingness. Even the littlest sister, when I told her James had turned around and was coming back towards the marriage, said she wasn't sure that that was good enough for James to come to the wedding. What? For weeks, I tried talking to the different family members, trying to gauge what was going on. Shouldn't we be welcoming the prodigal son back? I mean, isn't that literally what that story is about? One of the fold returning home and you throw your arms around them and throw a party you're so glad they're back? Why is everyone acting like they've moved on? You all were just out here only a few months ago. And then it hit me. The family had been shamed. And it didn't matter that James was possibly on his way back to me. The damage had been done. And I realized to my horror 
that James's family was not some strong Christian family who stood by the morals of love, hope, and forgiveness. Oh, no. They were a smoldering pile of self-righteous shit. The kind who pats each other on the back for honoring the Sabbath like Chick-fil-A, but who won't associate with a repentant adulterer. They were the worst of the worst. They were the kind of people I hate. Proud. And I had married one of them. I started to see where my husband's religious fucked upness began. No wonder he walked away from God and subsequently his wife and child. James had grown up in the home of an associate pastor to one of the largest Presbyterian churches in the United States. The church had a very prestigious private school attached to it that all of his family attended. So James's dad's job was also his church, was also his school, was also his family. It was one tightly knotted ball of string that all connected to each other. And everything was so connected that James couldn't part and parcel out the good from the bad. He couldn't separate the bullshit from the truth. Pride and self-righteousness on the surface look really, really good. The actions of a hypocrite can look just like a saint's. Even I had been fooled that I was marrying into such a godly family. Instead, I was marrying into the worst kind of family, the kind that was using my individual wedding invitation as punishment to get back at their brother and son because he had smeared the family name. And so, James's sister told him not to come. Even knowing I was there with him in Florida, she told him not to come. And every family member called James and told him the same thing. You are not welcome here, but your wife is. I was crushed. James was crushed. And beautifully, we were crushed together. And because I was going to stand by my man, we went to his 10-year high school reunion instead. We were a team. Or so, I thought. I really fancied seeing all the faces of people I'd been hearing about for years in James's childhood. I was scared when I met his high school sweetheart that I'd be intimidated. Instead, I fell in love with her. She was so cute, so fun. Then James started introducing me to the rest of the crowd. Hi, Ricky, Bobby, Tammy, Sue. This is Jennifer. Hi, I'd say, gesticulating my left hand around, flashing my wedding ring, or making sure I drop into the conversation something about our son or our home in L.A. The whole night I was Jennifer. Not my wife, just Jennifer. And every single time he said it, I felt a knife cut my back where his hand lay. I was nauseated it was so painful. I thought to myself, here I am flying to Florida to support you and this really painful time of not being invited to your favorite sister's wedding and spending the last nine months of our lives pouring my heart out and guts to you while you went on a sin joyride to only have me introduced as Jennifer? Fuck you, James. The reunion moved to a private pool house with a ping pong table full of booze. I started in, pouring red solo cup after red solo cup to the brim. I had never mixed my own drinks before. I started hitting on James's high school sweetheart's husband. Noah, you're so hot. So hot. I started giggling uncontrollably, asking one of James's old classmates who was wearing a cat sweater if I could pet her pussy. Apparently, I made this request several times. Very loudly. At some point, I was weekend at Bernie's to a club. I think I just sat there in a corner. I don't remember any of this. The room was spinning. We came back to the hotel. I passed out. The next morning, James took me to the airport. He and Andrew's flight was a few hours later. I had to fly back to rehearsal in a different city. James dropped me off at the curb. I got my bags out and waved goodbye. Bye, James. I love you, I said as he started getting back into the driver's side door. Bye, Jen. I love you, too. And then he got into his car and drove away. Wait, did I just hear him say he loved me? Maybe it was an instinctual misstep. A few minutes later, he texted, Andrew and I will both miss you. We love you. <laughs> I shook my head in disbelief. I hadn't heard my husband utter those words in almost a year. Tune in next episode, episode five, My Husband Comes Home. Maybe. This is She Bangs, She Bangs, Marriage, Adultery, Texas, and Jesus. Find me on Twitter at Jennifer Bangs or shebangshebangs.com. Cheers. She bangs, Until next she time. Bangs, I'm wasted by the way she moves.